invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the 8th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. And today, Lord willing, this will be the fifth Bible message in a series of messages from Jeremiah on time, tears, and the title deed. I want to remind you of how that Jeremiah was compared to Jesus and Jesus was compared to Jeremiah over in Matthew chapter 16, beginning at about verse 14. And Jesus asked his disciples, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that you're John the Baptist, some say that you're Elijah, and some say that you are Jeremiah. And of course he said to them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And he said, I say unto you that you're Simon, you're just a little pebble on the beach, but upon the rock of myself I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall never prevail against it. And one reason we know that Jesus is exactly who he says he is, we can trace him all the way back to the Old Testament. And we can certainly see him in the life of Jeremiah. Now here at Matthew chapter 8, I've got some verses and some thoughts that I want you to write down that will make today's Bible message more understandable. I want you to write down Isaiah chapter 28, verses 9 and 10. And Isaiah asks a very important question. He says, For the Lord, and in the Lord's stead, he said, Who is it that I can teach knowledge to? And whom is it that I can give an understanding into doctrine? And then he goes on to declare, it has to be those that have been weaned from milk. And now they're on the meat of God's Word. And then he says, here a little and there a little. Precept upon precept and line upon line. A few Sundays ago when I was preaching this particular message, a man in the congregation stayed afterward and said, Brother Bingham, you scared me for a little while. I thought that you were going to preach the entire Bible. Well, you see, here's what we have to do. We have to put line upon line and precept upon precept. Here a little and there a little. And then we come into the understanding of doctrine and even the title of these five messages now. Time, tears, and the title deed. It was Jeremiah that saw the timeline of God. It is Jeremiah in the ninth chapter, like our wonderful Lord, weeping over Jerusalem over there in the 19th chapter of Luke that is called the weeping prophet. So now we've got Jeremiah seeing the timeline and we've got Jeremiah weeping prophet likened to our wonderful Lord. But also we see a title deed. By the time that you arrive at Jeremiah chapter 32, you remember how the Lord commanded Jeremiah to buy a parcel of land on the south side of Jerusalem toward Bethlehem. And Jeremiah thought in his mind, this is ludicrous. We're going to the Babylonian captivity. We're going to be there for 70 years. I'll never live to return. And of course, he was banished to Egypt. He didn't even get to go into the Babylonian captivity. And so Jeremiah, after being a 40-year prophet, knew that he would never return. And so he said, I'm going to buy it anyway. And the Lord said, I want you to go and record the deed with witnesses. Now let me put it together. We started in the 23rd chapter of the book of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was scolding and rebuking the false prophets of Israel. And they were promising the people of God a false peace. And they were saying, peace, peace. But God said, no, no, it's not going to be peace, but I'm going to send judgment because you've been slipped over completely into idolatry. And so in the 23rd chapter, he said, you've stolen my words. You've perverted my words. You've taken my words lightly. And it sounds like much of what is going on in our church world today. And so he goes on from the 23rd chapter, and he has a conflict with a false prophet by the name of Hananiah. Jeremiah was commanded to wear a yoke. And by everything that I can find chronologically, he wore that yoke around Jerusalem for a little over a year. And he was talking about the Babylonian yoke. 
And he said, now you may as well go ahead and submit to Nebuchadnezzar because he's coming and God is sinning. And God is going to use him as a chastening rod. And you may as well submit to the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar. It's a form of God's chastening. Hannah and I said, no, 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 no. He said, we're only going to be gone to Babylon for two years, not for 70 years. And he took the yoke of Jeremiah and he broke it. And today we could go back to Matthew 11, 28 through 30. And the great invitation, Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. People are learning of everything else instead of Jesus. He's the one that we need to know more about. And then we could travel over there to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 at verse 14 and look at the world today breaking the yoke. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Come out from among them. Be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. And so most of the church world today, they're breaking both of those yokes. They know very little about Jesus. And separation from the world is a thing of the past. And so then God moves on and prophesies through Jeremiah to Hananiah that, Hananiah, you are going to die. And within a year, Hananiah, he was dead. And so it moves on from there, and God gives a new covenant in the 31st chapter. It's already the covenant that we're walking in because we're believers, but it's formulated for the end time for believing Jews, this brand new covenant of Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning there at verse 31. But before the covenant is going to be realized by Israel, you've got the 30th chapter at verse 7. And there Jeremiah talks about the time of Jacob's trouble. And he's referring to the tribulation period. And Jesus mentions this tribulation period over in Matthew chapter 24 at verse 21. And he says, there's never been a time like it before and there never will be again. And so now with my understanding that I'm trying to share with you about the times and the seasons. And so Jeremiah, he knew the time, he shed his tears he had a title deed, and when Jesus returns to the Mount of Olives, the very place where he ascended at the end of seven years of tribulation, Jeremiah is going to inherit his land because he was always faithful unto God. And not only is Jeremiah going to inherit the land, we're also going to inherit it because we've been made covenant heirs to the land covenant that God made with Israel over in Deuteronomy chapter 31. So stay with me. Times and seasons are only found in three places in the Bible. The first time that it is used is Daniel chapter 2 at verse 21. And Daniel says God knows how to change the times and the seasons. Now, this is dispensational truth. And if you don't know that terminology, you need to become aware of it. And it means that God administers different things and different blessings and also different judgments at different times. And so right now, we're in a wonderful administration. We are in the administration of the grace of God. And this is called the church age that we are living in at this present time. So Daniel said he's going to change the times and the seasons. He's going to put kings on their thrones and they're going to fulfill the purpose of God and then God is going to remove them. And so I say to everyone that has a little county seat in their county and a dirty dozen that controls everything going on in the county and in the city and in the state and in the federal government and in every government that is known to man, it's but for a season and they will die out or God will remove them but his truth just keeps on marching on. Remember, it's in that same Daniel chapter 2 at verse 45 that Daniel after he talks about times and seasons and how that God has the power to change them that Daniel sees a stone that's been hewn out of the mountain 
but not with men's hands. He didn't come by the methodology of man, but he was given by God, and this stone is the rock of ages. The one that I mentioned a moment ago, upon this rock I'll build my church, the gates of hell will never prevail against him. And he is rolling down the kingdoms of this world until the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of of our God. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory and it's for how long? It's forever, dear brother. And I'm glad I'm already at this very moment in the church age a kingdom citizen and I'm waiting now for the dawning of the kingdom age. And so I know something about the times and the seasons. Second time that you find times and seasons, Acts 1 verses 6 and 7, Jesus has appeared to his disciples for 40 days and now he's getting ready to ascend to heaven. He leads them out as far as the Mount of Olives and they ask him the question, will you now at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? That's what I want to see because when he restores the kingdom of Israel, I know who the king is going to be. I know the throne that he's going to occupy. He's going to occupy the throne of his father David I know the worship that is going to follow because we're going to cry hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And the seraphims and the cherubims, they'll go on crying holy, 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 and we'll be crying hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah because the king is going to take his rightful place. Now there's no need in trying to contradict it. There's no need in trying to wrestle against it. The only thing you have to do is go and read Psalms chapter 2. And the psalmist says, why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. And they say, we're not going to live according to God's moral will. We're going to cast his bands asunder and we're going to take the cords of biblical morality and we're going to lay them in the junk heap pile because now we're a progressive society. We're a society that can control its own destiny. We know more even than the living God knows. He says, but don't you know that God in his mind has already set he is a king upon his holy hill of Zion. And for those that have declared, we're going to wrestle against the Lord's anointing. We're going to cast his bands and his cords asunder. And we're going to live as we choose to live. He said he's going to have them in derision and he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh but he turns to us that know the times and the seasons and he said I want you to serve the Lord and worship him with rejoicing and at the very same time that you're serving him or worshiping him with rejoicing I want you to do it with trembling because he's an awesome God and on one side you've got the ability to be able to rejoice But on the other side, you know the times and the seasons and you can go all the way back to Eden and the day of innocence and the day of conscience and the day of government and the day of promise and the day of the law and you know that God was formulating everything that in the fullness of time that God sent forth His Son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law the law that it right now at this present time we have received the adoption of sons awaiting now the kingdom to come and we're crying Abba Father for we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear but the spirit of adoption whereby we cry Abba Father and so like Mephibosheth that was adopted by David I'm living with expectation like Esther that was adopted Adopted by Mordecai, I'm living in anticipation. And then again, like we see uh, uh, Moses adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. Oh, when Moses was come to years, he realized that he had a better kingdom. And he was not afraid. And he chose rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God, watch this, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a what? For a season, brother. He knew the times and the seasons. 
land, and he knew that there was something far more permanent than Egypt. I tell you, Egypt was once my home. I was a slave, helpless and sin did roam, love and life. I did crave, but I looked up to heaven's dome and Christ came to save. And I'm living in Canaan now. And I know the time and the season. I'm getting ready to cross over. And there'll be no more battles to fight. There'll be no more wars to be waged. And we'll lay down this robe of flesh. And we will arise in his likeness. And then we will be satisfied. Are you ready for the text now? Matthew chapter 8 and listen to what he says here in the 8th chapter beginning at verse 28 and when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesians there met him also Gadara met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs exceeding fierce so that no man might pass by that way and behold they cried out saying what have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? Oh, dear friend, if the demons are aware of the time, how much more alert and aware should his church be today of the times and the seasons? Daniel 2 and 21, times and seasons. Acts chapter 1, 6 and 7, Times and seasons, Jesus answered them and said, It's not for you to know the times and the seasons that the Father has placed in his own power. You've got a job to do right now, and a little bit later on, you're going to understand more about the times and the seasons. And you're going to become like the church at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For ye yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction is going to come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now look, these two demon-possessed men, you also find them in Mark 5 and Luke chapter 8, they were aware of the time. And they said, Jesus, we know that you're here for a particular reason at this time. Our day has not yet come. But dear friend, isn't it wonderful that we can announce to the devil, even at this time and this season, devil, you're already a defeated foe. And it's not going to be long until all of us are going to be able to bruise Satan underneath our feet. And the final victory is going to be won. Look over at Revelation chapter 12. And let's notice again of the devil being aware of the time. This is very familiar. This is three and a half years into the tribulation period. And look what happens here in the 10th verse. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God. The church age has been concluded. Write it down right beside of verse 10. Write down Luke 21, verse 24. And Jesus said, Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. You also find that in Romans eleven twenty-five, and then again over here in Revelation 11 at verse 2. He says, now listen, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Now understand, right now at this very moment, Satan has access to heaven. And I've taught you this before. You can go over to Job chapter 1. And there was a day that the sons of God came to appear before God. And Lucifer, the old devil, was right in the midst of them. And he raised up his ugly head and he accused Job. 
He accused him. And he said, if you'll let me touch him, if you'll, if you'll let down the hedge around Job and let me touch him, he will curse you and deny you. And the battle was on. And yep. Bildad and Elphaz and Zophar, the three so-called friends Preach. of Job, and as the old saying goes, with friends like them, who needs enemies? They had no understanding whatsoever of what was going on. And a lot of times, we judge other people's lives. And we've got no understanding whatsoever of the difficulty, the burden, the spiritual warfare that they might be encountering and that they might be going through even at this present time. So he was there to accuse. Now, three and a half years into the tribulation, God said, I've had enough. I'm not going to listen to him any longer. But right now, even though he has access, listen to what we have. He says, I write unto you, little children, that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, who is the propitiation, the covering. The propitiation for our sin. And not for our sin only, but for the sin of of the whole world. And so I'm thankful that every time the devil accuses me that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father and he is my advocate, he is my attorney, and he can rebuke every accusation. And even when the accusations are true, look at verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and a word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. But there's coming a time that God says three and a half years into the tribulation you're going out and he's going to come down and listen to what the scripture says here now in verse 12. Therefore rejoice in heaven that you don't have to hear his blabbering mouth any longer. And dear friend I want to warn every Christian if you've got an accusing spirit it's always somebody else's fault. And I'd go to church if it wasn't for all the hypocrites and I'm just as good as any of them are and I don't know why they do this and why they do that I want to tell you you're full of the devil because he is the accuser of the brethren but there's an answer for it you can get it out by the power of the blood of the Lamb of God there were for rejoice ye heavens and them that dwell in them but woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath. He thinks he's got wrath. This is after the seven seals. This is after the seven trumpets. And now we're ready for God's seven bowls of wrath. The last three and a half years of the tribulation. And Mr. Satan, you think you're mad? You ain't seen mad. Because God has been long suffering toward usward. Not willing that any should perish, but that all men should come to repentance. And the low gospel preachers have told you the story of grace and glory, have told you about his wondrous love and how that God is rich in mercy, of how that God came down in flesh and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And I've told you that he did no sin. There was no sin found in him. And Pilate said, I find no fault. And Judas said, I betrayed the innocent some blood and the centurion said truly this man was the son of God and he was lifted up to die and he took your sin and my sin he who knew no sin was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him and you've refused him he's extended his hand of love and mercy and grace and forgiveness and you've ignored him and you you tried to say that you're good enough on your own to be saved. And God says, I'm sick of it, and I'm going to pour out my wrath. But for me, thank you, God. But for me, and for all the redeemed, I'm covered by the one that walked the winepress of the fierceness of God's wrath 
And God poured out all of his wrath, all of his indignation, all of his righteous anger was poured out on Jesus on the cross. And I've been there to the place of the great exchange. And I took his righteousness and he took my sin. And today I have no fear of the wrath of God because I'm covered by the blood of the Lamb of God not been appointed we could run right back over there to 1st Thessalonians 5 but brethren of the times and seasons you have no need that I write unto you and then he says you've not been appointed unto wrath glory 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 you see, if there's a little more preaching here, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. The yeah, devil has come, come down unto you yeah. having great wrath because he knoweth. Underline it. That he hath but a short yeah. time. And Christians setting up in churches all over the world today. Come on. And they're talking about catering to soccer moms and Preach. how to make them feel better about their busy routine That's and their lifestyle. I can tell them how to make them feel better. Quit all that crap you're doing and get them to Sunday school. Quit all that stuff you're doing. Bring them back to the house of God on Sunday night. Raise them up in prayer meeting. Take them by the hand. And instead of leading them to cheerleader or ballerina or whatever you're doing, lead them to the altar and pray an anointing of God over their life. I can can tell you how to uncomplicate yourself. Lift up your head. Our redemption is drawing nigh. Redeeming the time. Seeing that the days are evil. Lay aside the nonsense of this world. Lay aside all the hurt feelings of this world. And get your eyes upon the one that's going to declare that time will be no more. And we're going to have the dawning of eternity and a day that will never end. Yes. 